Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to ODI. Uh, my name is Marta Foresti. I'm the director here for Governance, Security, and Livelihoods, and it's a pleasure to welcome you and our online audiences to this really interesting meeting today that goes to the heart of some of the most important questions that in international development today. Um, I, um, before we get going on the sort of with the interesting debates, a few housekeeping notes for all of you. Please tweet tonight about this event if you've got views, insights, um, new ideas. There is an hashtag, which I think is on the screen, is um, aid impact, and use the ODI dev um, Twitter handle. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome three our three speakers tonight, and a bit more I'll say about them in a minute, but here is Alison Evans, who of course is welcome back to ODI, I used to be ODI's director, is now the Chief Commissioner on the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, ICA. I'm sure the, the acronym will come up again and again tonight. Um, we've got Neil, uh, sorry, who was there? So Neil, <laughs> Neil Cyrus is Director of the Financial Audit of the Overseas Departments for the National Audit Office, the NAO. And then finally, Pete Vowles, who works at the Department for International Development, is currently the head of program delivery at DFID, but also has a wealth of experience, many years of experience in sort of delivering aid programs in different parts of the world. Um, as many of you know, um, Stephen Twig, the chair of the IDC, was meant to join us today. Unfortunately, he can't be here. He's actually visiting a refugee camp and he's not going to come back um, on time uh, for the event. He's sent his apologies. Um, he was really hoping to be with us for this conversation tonight. Uh, but we'll make sure that we'll keep the IDC in mind um, as we have our conversations um, through the nights. Um, and the conversation is on the record, is, I believe is streamed online. Um, uh, so please remember to state your name when you make an intervention later in the, um, in the, in the discussion. Um, so as I said earlier, um, the issues that we're discussing tonight are actually very close to my heart. It's something that I, over the years I've always followed with great interest, the great debates about results, evaluation, scrutiny, accountability around aid and international development. And I think it's fair to say these issues are more important today than ever, and there is definitely a sense of this agenda being, um, uh, having really you know, grown over the years. Um, and in fact, Justin Greening, who was in this room not that long ago, a few months ago, um, shortly after the elections, she mentioned, she described DFID as probably the most scrutinized government department in the UK. So what we're going to do tonight is quite, you know, trying to find out whether that's the case, and if that's the case, whether that has any significant consequences for the way um, we think about um, aid and development. And he, I'm also hoping that tonight we might also get to demystify some of this debate. It's a debate that often gets very polarized about people who think that they're, you know, the, you know, scrutinizing aid is, is you know, is, is, is all about sort of really sort of, you know, checking on every, every penny spent and making sure that's, um, that greets the results and others have, <laughs> and others have very strong views about how this really goes against the, you know, the, you know, the, the true spirit of doing good around the world. And I really hope that tonight we'll make, you know, we'll make some progress in finding a useful middle ground in, um, in what is often an unhealthy debate on some of those issues. Um, it's also fair to say that these days, the scrutiny on the UK spend on, inter on, on, on aid is uh, as, as great as ever was. So there are a number of, of bodies, and some of them are represented in, you know, in, the, in the debate tonight, whose job is you know, to, to play you know, to, to look into um, ODA, ODA, ODA spent and, and diff, the way DFID um, used some of that money. Um, so we've got ICAI, the Parliamentary Committee, the NAO, and also there is on aid, we should never forget the role that the NGO sectors has and the media on providing, you know, opinions and scrutiny on how well um, the UK is doing and how well DFID is spending the money. The other issue that, of course, is in the room tonight with us is the 0.7% commitment and the fact that this, you know, in the UK at the moment there is a significant investment in, in aid, um, more so than in many other countries, and expectations are high on how well that, uh, that money is spent. And all of this has generated a very interesting debate, including at ODI uh, with some of my colleagues, about um, the, the importance of thinking through notions of scrutiny, accountability, learning, and making sure that this money uh, leads to 
impact and change in ways that is certainly unprecedented. So having set the scene with this, um, some of these important challenges, um, let me just um, introduce Alison, who, as I said, um, is now the Chief Commissioner of ICAI and is also someone that over the years has followed and contributed to some of these debates around the importance of evaluation and scrutiny and learning um, in aid and development at the World Bank, um, at ODI, and now in this new really important role. Um, so, Alison, your mandate covers the scrutiny of all UK ODA, so it's not just DFID but also DEC and, and FCO, and also it's not just about money, actually. The expectations are high about making sure that DFID actually delivers change and saves lives. And all this in a world of competing priorities where we're all aware that um, the expectation of what aid can do for development, think about the debates around the SDGs, is evolving all the time. So four months in, and it's interesting because I thought Alison was in the job for about a year and a half, but... <laughs> Four months in into a new job, what are your priorities and what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> Thank you, Marta, uh, and thanks very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I should say that I, you know, I alone am not ICAI. I have three other commissioners working with me uh, as part of the of of the commission for the next four years. I also am well supported by a permanent secretariat and also a. Uh, a review team that does a lot of the heavy lifting around our review work. So um, I am, in a sense, here speaking on behalf of, of, of all those professionals who are committed to, to ICAI's work. Um, just let me say a couple of things perhaps about, about ICAI and how I see and how I think we see it positioning itself for the next four years of work, and then maybe just uh, a couple of things <laughs> what keeps me awake at night. I'll think about that as I'm answering um, the first point. Um, ICAI was established by the coalition government. Uh, the idea was basically led by Andrew Mitchell when he was Secretary of State for International Development. And ICAI came into being as a non-departmental public body. You can go and look that up and find out that, what that is. Um, basically in, in 2011. It means that we operate independently of government uh, but we are reporting to the International Development Committee and support it in its efforts to hold to account, uh, particularly the Department for International Development, for its uh, delivery of UK ODA. Uh, but, and here's a question in a sense for the future, increasingly needing to think about, uh, possibly at least, uh, departments beyond DFID that are uh, also involved in in delivering parts of the UK ODA budget. Uh, and I think that's going to be some, an interesting question as we go through the discussion today about how important that is and where that might be going in the future. Um, ICAI was set up to, as Marta says, to scrutinize, uh, to be part of the scrutiny architecture uh, around uh, UK aid spending. Um, and that scrutiny role means we have to ask the question constantly, what is being achieved, how is it being achieved, um, and, and do we have good evidence that uh, what uh, UK aid is supporting in the world is a good use of public money. But I think the flip side for me of scrutiny is assurance, and I think assurance is quite an interesting notion for us in ICAI, because assurance is also about trying to give confidence to, um, particularly to the UK taxpayer through the work of the International Development Committee, that uh, public money in this domain is is being spent well, is being effect, uh, it's spent effectively. And um, I think that assurance role is quite an interesting one for us, because I think that what constitutes giving confidence of good value for money is something particularly in a changing international context, a lot of challenges that UK aid is having to grapple with. You know, what does good assurance look like in that, in that setting, I think, is something that we think about a lot. And I'm sure Neil will say something about that, because that's kind of core business, really, for the NAO. So it is a very interesting time. It is an interesting context. Now, ICAI has existed, has had a commission for four years prior to uh, the new commission being appointed and starting work in July, and they have really kind of broken ground, if you like, around this particular model of doing scrutiny. 
And I think our challenge for the next four years is to sort of stand on the shoulders of those four years and see how we can continue the good work, but maybe also expand and stretch some of it to take account of this more complex and definitely changing international development context and what is, I think, an increasingly complex geometry of accountabilities, uh, both here within the UK but also uh, abroad in all those countries where UK, the UK is delivering ODA. Um, and actually, I think the first challenge that we as a new commission were presented with is how can we, in this relatively complex accountability and scrutiny environment, actually add value as an independent commission? Um, and I think we've spent, spent a fair amount uh, of time trying to think that through. And I think our value added primarily comes from our desire to focus on impact. What is being delivered and how is it being delivered? And that means putting a fair amount of emphasis, not exclusive, but a fair amount of our emphasis on what you might call the end of the results chain. We really want to understand what difference UK aid is making in the world. And to do that, we need to have a good understanding of the models of change that underpin what UK aid is trying to do in the world. Hence the fact that we also need to spend quite a bit of time understanding the sort of theories of change that UK aid is working with, and DFID in particular, to deliver that change. Um, the, so one is about us sort of working out our value added. What is our niche role in this crowded scrutiny market? And that requires us to work out our comparative advantage with the NAO. And we've got conversations going on about that. It's also about working out our relative advantage to, obviously, the IDC, the International Development Committee of the Parliament, who does its own independent inquiries that ask searching questions of, of, of how UK ODA is being used. And it's also important that we see ourselves in relation to the kind of scrutiny that DFID does on itself. So we have to position ourselves in that complex <laughs> landscape. So the focus on impact, is, for me, is a, a really important attempt at product differentiation. But we want to look at impact through a number of different lenses. And I can go into more of that, perhaps, as we go through the conversation. Um, there was a triennial review of ICAI undertaken in 2013. All these non-departmental bodies are subject to, essentially, a cabinet office review. And one was undertaken of ICAI in 2013. And while it sort of secured ICAI's future for the coming period, it also asked ICAI to try to be a little bit more thematic in its, um, in its focus. So take on the sort of bigger, more wide-ranging strategic issues, if you like, that, that DFID and UK generally is grappling with so that it could really you know, uh, uh, touch on the most significant aspects of UK AIDS work. It also, in a sense, asked us to look at sort of big development problems that UK AID was tackling from multiple angles so we can understand the multiple instruments. And that includes not only the financial support but the technical support and so forth that DFID is, is committing to trying to help solve some of those problems. So actually, in our work program for ICO over the next four years, we're taking some of those guides or leads from the trial review quite seriously and trying to build a work program that is a bit more strategic, is more thematic, and does allow us to look at development problems from, from multiple angles. Um, so as to what uh, keeps me awake at night, well, I think one of the things is really the... the, the that, you know, the, the ability to, to keep pace uh, with a very fast-moving aid environment in which uh, the, the, the context within which the sort of standard operating model for the delivery of ODA seems to be sort of changing rapidly in front of our eyes at the moment. And the crucial thing for ICA is can we stay relevant, timely, and robust in the work that we do to keep pace with that. And I don't think that's not a minor deal because we're very aware that you know, DFID is in constant thinking mode, but also the context within which DFID is positioning itself, UK aid is positioning itself, is you know, many moving parts in there. 
And we need to make sure that the kind of scrutiny work we do is keeping pace, in a sense, with some of those directions of change. And that, you know, we're not in the policy business. We're in the has it worked business. But at the same time, the kind of context within which we're trying to ask has it worked, is it, is it delivering, is changing. So that's what keeps me, that's quite a big thing to keep me awake at night. But that basically is keeping me awake at night. Thank you, Alison. And um, I think this is a, a great point to hand over to Pete to see whether he, he shares some of the burdens of <laughs> what does he feel to be running at that fast pace from, um, from, from within DFID. Um, before I hand over to you quickly, um, I, I think this question about stretching and expanding and this ever-changing landscape for development is something to come back to time and time again tonight. Because if the challenge on the one hand is on scrutinizing, you know, the, the sizable aid budget, the challenge at hand is also one of being able to change and innovate and, and, and challenge sort of business as usual as you do that. Um, so, Pete, um, as I mentioned, you've been in DFID for some time and you've been working on, you know, on, on several um, fronts, also on the what works side um, with Alison. And I think your job right now, it is at the heart of that fast pace moving, you know, trying to rethink the way DFID delivers um, its work and its program. So this, you know, this great level of scrutiny, how does it feel like from within? And is it all a challenge or are there also opportunities that are coming with it? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll make a couple of opening points and hopefully we'll come back to the conversation. Um, I'd just say um, that if you detect any defensiveness or corporate spin, I hope you'll put your hands up and challenge me, because I, I think we need to have, the, I think the point, the bill of this is to have a frank and open debate, so I, I hope we do that. I think the, um, you know, for, for us, I guess, for DFID, and, I, and I'm talking for my, my role in terms of responsible for the program processes, capabilities, skills, incentives, and how we run programs, um, is, is largely that we take the scrutiny really seriously, and it's really important for, for DFID. Um, it's really important that we have people who can challenge us and, and test us and ask us questions um, and that we can respond to that kind of feedback. So that's really important. Um, and, and it does have an impact. So we can come on to examples of how, particularly how ICLO, but others, how kind of some of the reports and scrutiny has had an impact on the organization and what we do as a result of, of what we hear from, those, from, those, from that level of scrutiny. I think it's important to say there's, you know, to say there's, there's, there's lots of scrutiny. There's in terms of, and, and, all, and all playing a slightly different function. But in, in addition to the ones that Alison sets out, there's obviously our responsibility to the to the uh, development assistance committee, um, to how we want to be accountable to the governments and partners in which we work in the countries, and ultimately to the citizens and, and beneficiaries, whichever language you choose, uh, who we're, who we're working for, and I guess our, some of our partners. So just trying to the kind of accountability goes goes all the way around in many ways. Um, and I guess the key thing is it has to be, for us, it has to be value-adding um, and, uh, and, and, and challenge us. Um, but I guess it's also important for us as DFID staff to value it. Uh, and that's quite an important leadership competence, I think, for, for all development workers. And whether you're in DFID or in an NGO organization or a contractor, how, you know, do you value scrutiny? Do you, when someone asks you questions, do you open the cabinet and show all the skeletons and have a conversations about with, with our internal audit or national audit <laughs> colleagues what we're worried about. And I think that's a really important um, challenge for us to make sure that we are, we really do value the scrutiny that we are under. Um, I think it's also just to say that we often talk about DFID under scrutiny, but also it, it's about how we provide scrutiny throughout the delivery chain. So if you're a partner of, of DFID, if you receive funding, how do we scrutinize uh, that funding? And, that, and that's an important part. So it kind of works both ways. Um, and I think there's some, um, some sort of similar principles about how we kind of how we have a, conversations throughout the delivery chain, how our partners open to conversations with us, having that kind of open dialogue about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's an interesting challenge. For both of those, so whether you're, whether you're in DFID for thinking about the scrutiny from, from around, from upwards and around our accountability to Parliament or, or downwards in terms of how we exert that scrutiny over our our partners, um, it's really, really important to get that balance right. And I think, you know, it's worth just kind of reflecting that is a fine balance. Um, too much, necessarily, not necessarily coherent, can, I mean, imagine if you're a, a DFID staff member in a, in a country office and you've, you've got kind of consecutive incoherent reviews coming in from different parts of it. Too much, that can lead, and I think it's important to sort of set this, that can lead to a, a kind of psychological defensiveness if you constantly feel you have to, you're defending what you're doing. Um, 
too little and we lose control over what's going on and we don't have the ability to provide assurance and confidence up, up to ministers and, to, and to, to Parliament. So I think it's really important just to recognise that, 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 that balance um, and obviously that's something that I know that ICAI and NAO and internal audit spend a lot of time working through to make sure it is coherent and it is um, consistent. Um, but just to recognise that there's a kind of there's a balance there between the kind of upwards and downwards, and then the kind of levels and, and amounts. But I guess the kind of overall starting message is, you know, we, we really value uh, the the scrutiny we get, particularly from my I guess, in terms of the sort of reports over the last couple of years and how we, you know, and we can talk through as we go through the debate about what's what's worked and what and, and how we respond to those. Um, thank you, Pete. And let's make sure that we get back to this balance between the different forms of scrutiny and the importance of their coherence, because I think um, and it'd be good to get the view from those of you who are involved in some in, on the scrutiny bodies to, to tell us a little bit about uh, how that's going. Uh, but before uh, we move on to that, um, Neil, is it true that DFID is the most scrutinized um, department in government, or is it us in the sector always have a feeling that you know, we are... We are People pay, you know, are too mean with us and way, too, mean, way more lenient with others. I have a slight problem with the way the issue is actually phrased. I have to say, I mean, surely scrutiny is good. I mean, it's it's positive change. It's learning. It's sort of developing insight. Um, it, it surely one cannot have too much of a good thing. Um, <laughs> Taking that slightly more seriously, I suppose, uh, I mean, a, an audit genuinely, or any form of scrutiny, is an opportunity to understand what has worked well and to give wider insights to the effectiveness of the work and to give it to a wider audience. And, you know, genuinely, scrutiny done effectively and proportionally is a thing that no one should be afraid of and people should welcome. So that's my plug for the auditing profession. Um, Going back to the specific question, um, does does DFID and does ODA get greater scrutiny than any other part of government? And I'm not sure it does. Um, it certainly doesn't get much more than most. Every government department has to produce its annual accounts and they get audited by the NAO. Uh, every government department is subject to value for money work from the NAO. DFID gets less than most, simply because of its size in proportion to the overall government spend. I think we probably do one value for money study per year on DFID. Uh, HMRC gets five. So we can talk about proportionality on that one later on. Every government department will get select committee interest, very slightly depending upon the, the breadth of a select committee's interest and, and how much anyone in one committee is supposed to cover. But Every government department gets the same level of scrutiny. The press interest, the academic interest, um, they're much the same as far as I can see for DFID as they are for any other government department. The one difference, of course, fairly importantly, is we've got ICAI in, in the ODA space. But, but even that, I would argue, is not totally different. Every other government department has some form of additional external scrutiny, whether or not it's um, an assurance committee that is set up to represent the interests of users or, or some form. DWP has the, the Social Security Advisory Committee. They have different remits and they have different um, levels of uh, activity, and I would accept that ICAI probably does a bit more than, than most because of its remit, but I would argue that it's not, not hugely more. Thank you. An important reality check um, um, on, 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 on some of this. So um, let's stay a little bit with this theme about DFID and the rest of, of government. Um, as Alison, you mentioned that what keeps you awake at night, awake at night is the fact that there, is a, you know, there are lots of change going on and the pace about this change it is, is difficult to keep up with. Um, certainly one of the, the trends, the, one, of the, one of the things that in, this, in development we are hearing more and more about is the realisation that aid alone um, cannot achieve the kind of transformative change that, say, the SDGs have put on the agenda for the next 15 years, and a lot of attention on the importance of going beyond aid. So how does ICAI handle this, on the one hand, the focus on, um, on, on aid, and, and as you said, and we have the scrutiny at the end of the results chain to make sure that aid has actually delivered what it was meant to, with the need to actually go beyond aid and in many ways challenge some of the... Um, some of the existing paradigms around what aid 
is and how it's meant to operate and how well it can connect across different policy areas. Mm. Okay. Um, I mean, I suppose that I would start with, I'm not sure that any of us have ever believed aid was going to solve all the development problems out there. And I think to some extent it's a slightly unhelpful starting point. I mean, I think there's no one in, in the department or elsewhere ever believed that they were the only, you know, that, that, that UK aid was was the only only source of, of change. Of course not. But is it the case that there's a certain amount of rethinking about, you know, what part aid plays in um, tackling uh, difficult, sometimes complex, sometimes enduring development challenges? Absolutely. I mean, there is no question. And that's partly coming rightly from the fact that so many partner countries now are doing so much more for themselves and that's a really good thing so actually part of the adjustment is i think for us to understand how aid can add value to those things that domestic uh, institutions and organizations and other uh, entities are actually doing uh, uh, to contribute to solving development problems which then does raise a really interesting challenge, I think, for us in ICAI, which is how do we take account of the fact consistently and robustly and, 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 and in a very sort of searching manner, the fact that a lot of, a vast majority of UK aid is delivered through others and delivered in parallel with other sources of, of financing. So this idea that we can follow the UK pound consistently uh, transparently, all the way down to the point of delivery, of course, is, isn't, you know, it's one of those inconvenient facts, isn't it, that it isn't really quite like that. And what we have to do is have methodologies that really can understand the context, the partnership context, uh, the fact that funding is increasingly blended. Uh, we've got to try and get to grips with that and make sure that the kinds of scrutiny that we're doing is asking the questions about how all of that is coming together and the contribution that UK aid is making to all of that. And that, you know, I think that's a, that's a huge challenge. I mean, I would be completely um, erroneous to say that, oh, that's just a straightforward shift in focus. You know, that is big. Because we still have a huge obligation and a requirement to report <laughs> on the contribution that, you know, UK ODA is making, and therefore we have to be able to keep sight of it. But the context in which it's happening is getting much more complex. It's also the case that, you know, there, there is, a, from within the development co uh, community, a strong acknowledgement that, you know, aid is usually at its best when combined with other policy levers. And I suppose the question for us, be that in the trade sphere or in the the climate space and what we need to understand you know our role is not making policy here we're very much about trying to find out what is happening and why it's happening and whether it's working but we need to keep abreast of how DFID is thinking about that so that we can understand where aid flows are headed and how they're being considered alongside other instruments of government and uh, at the country level of course you know that's in a sense where all this is meant to come together and so one of our foci in ICAI's work is always to go down to the country level to understand, try and understand how all these various uh, 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 aspects of UK government policy that are supporting development uh, are coming alongside ODA. Um, I think that the, we've got a theme that we've, uh, we've got four themes and we're going to add another one, so we've got five themes uh, that we want to spend our time focusing on over the next four years. They are um, up on our website. But one of our themes is Beyond Aid. But the minute we put that up, in a sense, so then we have to say, what do we mean by that? What is that all about? And how do we make sure that we stay with a clear focus on ODA's contribution, if you like, to this new agenda around Beyond Aid? And I think I'm hoping that you're going to help me a bit with thinking that through, <laughs> because actually that is the frontier I think of our work. It's certainly the case in the first commission that they did some mapping of where ODA is going outside of DFID. There was a certain desire to look at, at mechanisms that cut across government departments. And there are now more of those, I think. And potentially, we simply don't know where the spending review will come out. But, you know, interesting question whether there'll be more money flowing through those cross government mechanisms. But essentially, we've got to keep sight 
of the way in which DFID and other government departments are collaborating with one another. And to the extent that there's odour being spent through those instruments, we need to take a look at them and see whether we can establish whether those are effective mechanisms or not. And I think the IDC is very interested in the way in which those kinds of instruments will evolve over time. Okay, thank, um, um, thank you. Let, let's stay a little bit with this theme about the importance of beyond aid and, um, and, um, and, and how it works in practice across policy areas. Alison mentioned that when all of this comes together is at the, pro is at the country level, where those levers that you know, can, you know, can help achieve change can be identified and used. So, Pete, um, going back to DRC and being responsible for a multi-million um, budget um, of, of, um, of, you know, a different multi-million budget in the country. How is it like? How does it work at the country level when you have that, you know, that, that the, the budget to spend but at the same time need to do that work around, you know, the policy areas that will allow to make the most of, of that budget? Yeah, thanks, Martha. I think, um, I think it's worth saying, I mean, it is worth saying, it is, you know, an incredibly challenging environment somewhere like mm -hmm. the, the DRC and, and, and living and working in for those who have or haven't in Kinshasa. Um, and how you, how you, how we manage as the UK the kind of the ambition that we have uh, in countries such as the Congo. Um, I guess the kind of starting point is, you know, we have a much better now, and I think in the last two to three years, much better kind of diagnostic tool to look at um, what a country context is and what the kind of drivers of poverty reduction will be in that in that context. And they might be bilateral aid. They might be through the multilateral system. They might be. That's, you know, we're not alone in the UK. So what are the other what are other international partners doing? Uh, and recognising that we're a player, not the player. Sometimes it's easy to forget that in the UK. Um, and, and then think about what the other government departments in, in the UK, what our competence areas might be. So I think, you know, some, where we talk about tax reforms, or are there, do we have experiences domestically or internationally that we can draw on uh, to help um, in tax revenue, for instance, in Tanzania? Um, I think actually also then when, you, when, we, when we end up with designing programmes to sort of fit within that overall diagnostic, uh, what I guess one of the key lessons from, Cong from Kinshasa and Congo is that actually I think for many years we sort of assumed that we could contract out some of the politics uh, and we asked implementing partners to implement really complex security and justice programs and actually one of the things we realised is that we can't contract it all out. We actually need to play a role ourselves. We need to use our diplomatic expertise from the Foreign Office and others to try and help then have that kind of conversation so that our delivery partners can get on with some of the technical delivery and where the ambassador can come in and provide a, a kind of diplomatic role on something as complicated as and complex as security and justice. So I think that kind of idea of bringing more whole, whole of government approaches is something that we just need to do more of and think, think more about where it's relevant. And actually it might be that in other cases that there is just a case for a more simple bilateral program. Um, and it might be that we feel that the World Bank or, or other multilaterals have a better place to, to act than we do. And I think we just have to have that, that conversation about who's best place to act um, and, what, and what the opportunities are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Neil, from, from an auditing perspective, this specific challenge about the fact that in reality there is a need to work through others, there is, you know, there is a need to get contracts in place for others, and there is a need to scrutinise and make sure that those contracts deliver um, the value for money um, that they originally intended to. How much, you know, from your perspective, how much of that is, uh, is it a challenge, is it changing? Again, is there anything specific about you know, the way aid works um, in relation well, to contracting? Um, Alison referred earlier on to the, the one of the things that keeps her awake at night being the increasingly complex delivery chain um, and that is the thing which keeps me awake at night as far as the audit is concerned because as as the aid um, program gets more complex in its use of uh, well it's different mechanisms it's different partners it's different ways of delivery um, so it gets increasingly difficult for us to be able to audit down to the use of the specific DFID funds in any individual country office program or individual project. And f as soon as you talk about blending monies between partner organisations, the, the risk is that you, you lose sight of where the, the, um, the UK government money has gone. Not too much of a problem as far as we're concerned, you know, with your partnering with other government departments within the UK, that's fine, I can just about handle that. But when you're, ha you're, you're, you're dealing with sort of either multilaterals or sort of country partners, it gets much more complicated. And, and frankly, we, we've taken the easy way out on this one, really, which is to sort of turn around to the department and say, so how do you assure yourself that this money is going to the right place and to the right people and at the right time? What are your mechanisms for actually uh, obtaining assurance? Um, and 
the department does have such mechanisms in place, and, and they are quite mature and they're quite sophisticated in many cases. But as always, as you're expanding into, into this sort of environment and, and you're using this more and more, so you're increasingly sort of using more and more people within your organization to get involved in this, and, and people's capacity has to sort of grow to be able to encompass this. The people who are the responsible officers for the individual programs have to understand what questions they need to ask about how partner organizations are actually using their funds. And sometimes those are difficult conversations. Sometimes you have to sort of go to the, well, I won't give examples, but you, you, have, you have to go and sort of challenge the individual government concerned and say the raw data just doesn't make much sense. Ultimately, there's political decisions in a lot of this. You know, but DFID and other government departments sort of awareness of the risk environment and awareness of the mechanisms it needs to put in place to gain its own assurance does need to get more sophisticated. Can I, can yes. I say something there? I think this the mention of risk is really, is really pertinent, actually, because, you know, the risk, the risk context is, is, um, is something that I, that I know that DFID is taking, you know, some time to think about how to appraise, you know, risk and, and develop perhaps different approaches to its tolerances to risks and so forth. And I think this, this is something that presents us as scrutineers with a, a genuine challenge um, and something we need to get on top of. Because, in fact, how we independently sort of assess DFID's approach to risk and whether that is sufficient to actually, uh, you know, kind of underwrite the rewards it's claiming or the results it's claiming is something that, you know, is actually quite hard to do from a distance and is something that we have to spend a bit of time thinking about how to do well. But in the end, I think that's where we've got to go. We've got to appraise this kind of risk-reward mindset that is operating in DFID, because actually that is the thing that's driving them into certain geographies at scale, particularly at the moment, obviously, in, in the MENA region. And, and we need to get to grips with whether we think that analysis that they're doing is actually adequate to the task and whether the right kind of risk and the right level of risk is be t being taken for the kind of development benefit that they are, or humanitarian benefit that they are claiming down the line. And I see that as a really important challenge for all of us, but something we have to be pressing the department on continually. And, and Pete, how, I mean, you, you've been working quite a lot with this notion of, of risk and making sure that the, the programming tools and the incentives that DFID is, you know, has can handle you know, risk in different ways and making sure that this does not prevent uh, making some of the, you know, the, the hard choices for making the most, uh, you know, the most impact. So what, what is your take on this important need to think carefully and, and, and confront the hard questions about risk and rewards and what it means for impact? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think we've, we've probably in the past, um, you know, maybe five years ago, we sort of probably treated risk as kind of something that was kind of constant and, and, and the same across our portfolio. And actually, I think, you know the kind of maturity rate. Oh, well, just pause. I think one of the one of the challenges actually is that maybe maybe other parts of the UK government, their their kind of incentives are to minimise risk. Actually, for DFID, we're actually trying to take risk, and that's a sort of different kind of uh, challenge in many ways because we need to take risk explicitly and openly. What kind of risks are we taking um, in the kind of context in which we're working? If we're working in Somalia, what are the risks we're taking in Somalia? And and, just, and having that kind of open conversation about it um, early on. I think that. Um, <coughs> Certainly, we need to be able to, you know, we need people across the organisation and partners to be able to understand where money is going and to be able to kind of map the delivery chain and and, and, and try to particularly where it's really where it's complex. I, I guess before that, we actually need to be really explicit about what the appetite, our risk appetite in a given context, really is. So our risk appetite in Zambia, for instance, might be very different from our risk appetite <laughs> in Somalia. And let's have that and let's explain that and start to understand the risk and return um, kind of equation that we're having about the different kind of contexts in which we're working. And I think that's the point. That's the point where, through through the kind of parliamentary process, and through ministers approving portfolios and programmes in under a different kind of risk appetite, we're starting to have that that honest debate. So I think it's it's definitely a work in progress, and something we're trying to get better at. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, it's actually being a bit more explicit about things we might have been implicitly doing in the past, um, and just being really being able to have that conversation. Um, yeah. I, can I, can yes, I just come come in on that one because uh, it takes me back to conversation I used to have with my old boss, the, the former uh, Auditor General, who, who used to say that the problem with government, not just DFID, but the problem with government, was that it takes huge risks. It just doesn't recognise when it's taking them. 
and and I think government's risk, understanding of risk, awareness of risk, and ability to manage risk has improved greatly over the last sort of ten years. But it's not, it's not resolved yet, and I think, and I come back to what I said before about capacity within organisations. In a way, this is this thinking about risk and managing risk. In, in a sort of almost formalised way, is something that is not natural process for civil servants. Mm. And mm -hmm. we, we do need all parts of government, and DFID included within this, to, to get much better at understanding what risks it is running and putting in place effective uh, mitigations to deal with them and, and, and be honest and clear and open what it's actually doing with those. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. This seems to me like a good point where to maybe open up the conversation to a few of you. There are a couple of questions that we need to come back to, specifically uh, something that Pete said earlier about the importance of ensuring coherence uh, in the difference, you know, in the scrutiny efforts, in, so that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, um, you know, defeat its own purpose and, and creates offence uh, within those that have been scrutinised. Um, we'll take a few questions from, some, from, from you in the room and then online. As a reminder, we heard, you know, a, a couple of things that you know, were mentioned that I certainly would love to hear more. Balancing the good assurance, of, you know, for the UK public, while at the same time stretching and expanding the remit and challenging some of the, uh, some of those difficult questions and the rapid, you know, rapidly changing environment. Um, becoming more honest, open and transparent and, and, and realistic about risk and ways of, of, um, of addressing them. And finally, there's actually nothing special, nothing strange and nothing harder for DFID, like any other government department. You know, it gets scrutinised. That's a good thing, and perhaps actually could even more with it could even do with a bit more. Um, so on some of those, um, you know, on some of those provocation, let me open the the floor to all of you. I think there are uh, microphone roamings. Our online audiences, please um, um, do post your question. I'll make sure um, that they can be posted to the to the panel. In the same spirit of the conversation thus far, feel free to ask questions, but also to interact a little bit with some of the ideas that were put uh, were put forward by the by our panel. Okay. 